Welcome to the preaching and teaching series of House on the Rock, Lagos, Nigeria. Something is about to happen in your life. And now, here is Pastor Paul and a Forest. James Allen spoke a quote which is notable, and I read it in your hearing to preface the beginning of my thought this morning. Quotation opened. You are today where your thoughts have brought you, and you will be tomorrow where your thoughts will take you. James Allen. I also quote Albert Einstein. A person who never made a mistake also never tried anything new. Let's start by talking about mindsets. What is a mindset? A mindset is a processed way of thinking about everything that has become set the way that this building was liquid concrete, most of it, and it, it was poured into formwork to give solid concrete to the entire shape, frame, and form of this building. And so a mindset is a set way of thinking that is not easy to change or to shape or to redo. So once you have a way of thinking, my promise to you is that you don't want to change that way of thinking. So if you have a way of seeing certain things, including yourself, your future, your family, other human beings, other new creation species, it is difficult to change that way of thinking. And thinking is to your biology what seeing is to your mind. Let me say that correctly. Thinking is to your destiny what seeing is to your eyes. And so in the con context of mindsets, we see with our minds. Paul uses the term uh, that the eyes of your understanding might be enlightened, so your understanding has eyes. He again says, if our gospel be hid from any, it is hid from those whom the God of this world, the prince and the power of the air, has blinded their minds. He didn't say eyes. Blinded their minds that they would not believe this gospel. And so in Romans 12, one of the advocacies of Paul in the second chapter is after he has said, do not be conformed to this world, don't be shaped by its culture, by its norms and its values, but instead be shaped by the word of God, which is the behavior, etiquette, and ethical system for citizens of the kingdom of heaven, the new creation species. And you didn't apply for that citizenship. You were born in Zion. Your first birth was at Lagos Island Maternity or wherever your mother sired you. But your second birth, you were born into Zion. That happened when you believed the gospel in your heart and it was no longer hid from your understanding and it transformed you. The way you were transformed by the word of God to bring you into birth is the same way you continue to elevate from level to level as you proceed in life. And he uses a very interesting word to help you to renew your mind. And he uses the word transform, which in the Greek is meta, morphu. Meta is an interesting word. It, it is used in many circles to mean beyond what you can reference as big. So the word in the Greek is simply beyond. Um, when they asked Zuckerberg, the owner of um, WhatsApp and a few other platforms, why did he call his platform meta. And he said, because there's more to come. Again, he said, because it's beyond anything we have seen or that is precedented or referenced. And I want to use this morning to introduce you to the concept that you haven't seen anything yet. You have not seen who you are going to be yet. You normally slap the person on your side uh, and say to them, you, you haven't seen anything yet when it concerns me. But I need you to tell yourself this, that I, I want to talk to you, I, you haven't seen you yet. This is what David was customarily prone to do. He would sit down and talk to himself because there's some things that others won't tell you because they don't want you to progress. But you have to know how to tell yourself so that you believe you. 
You've done a proper assessment, you've analyzed yourself, and you've analyzed the propensity of God's way in your life to do things beyond, to do things metamorpho in your life, to cause you to evolve to where you never thought you could evolve before. I know that I can come up a step or I can come up two, but I don't know that one day, spirit, soul, and body, if I survive till the rapture, he's going to elevate me, body, soul, and spirit, and I'll meet him in the sky. And so meta means beyond reference. Morfu means to change. It means to transform, to become another, to become another version of yourself, the best version of who you are. Hallelujah to God. Can I preach to you for a minute? You have no reference in your imagination or your thinking yet of who you are going to end up as within the next five years of your life. And that means that you owe it to yourself to at least get a view, a glance of where he might be taking you to. Hallelujah to God. Let me make it plainer on the tables. If you remember about a decade ago, we all were hustling for a Blackberry phone. If you remember about 20 years ago, we would want to entertain ourselves domestically at home and we would go to Blockbuster if you happen to travel to the UK or the US so you could watch your movie on a VHS tape or a VCR cassette tape or on a CD or on a VCD. You remember? And they thought they were going to be in business forever and that that season of being able to sell that market would be with them at Blockbuster and at, at at Blackberry forever. They weren't the only ones. There was also Polaroid. Uh, when my uncle came back from the UK and he bought about three or four of us Polaroid cameras, we thought we were the best thing since sliced bread. And he would take a photograph and then it would take about a minute and then it would slide out a photograph for you. They didn't know Apple was coming. They didn't know Samsung had plans. They didn't know that a little boy called Steve Jobs was going to be used by God to think meta, beyond what was customary status quo in that time? Can I get a witness from you? Uh, and that's why I'm trying to suggest to you that, friends, you don't know what's coming soon. If you think the 20s uh, or the 2010s were acceleration, the acceleration we're going to see in these last six years of this decade are going to blow your mind. Maybe some of the Apple products will go out of business. There are things that we consider phenomenal today. Uh, do you not know that in Silicon Valley, it takes two minutes for something to become obsolete, that they have to slow down the production of the innovation because it's happening so fast. And that's why you have to think so far beyond. And it wasn't only Blockbuster, Blackberry, Polaroid. Who else was there? There was something else. Ah, uh, I forgot. Kodak. Now, now, mostly on that front, they're out of business. Who uses 35 millimeter? Who uses film anymore? You could take your photograph and do 20 shots of this frame right here in less than five seconds. And you have 20 pictures to choose from. And you can print them out on your printer at home on gloss or fine paper. And you have it on permanent digital record. Because back then when they made Polaroid, they were not thinking beyond yet. But at least they gave us a platform to start stepping towards beyond. You hear what I'm saying? You have to metamorphose. What does morpho mean? It means to change. When God has his end product as a butterfly, he doesn't start with a butterfly. He starts with an egg. And the egg thinks this is life. I like this legend. But before long, that life comes to an end and the egg transforms into pupa or rather lava. And, and now this is a new world. I like this level. And then it transforms again from lava to pupa and it starts rolling a cocoon for itself. So that the, the massive moment of transition is protected. Because when you're in transition, you cannot maximize who you used to be and you cannot yet capitalize on who you're going to be. So you must protect the process because in transition you are very vulnerable. You're not there yet, you're not back there yet. You're not who you used to be anymore, you're not who you're going to be yet. 
And then one day, when the process is completed, she finds her wings and she finds the wind with her wings. We can learn from them that your life has levels. It has steps. It has phases, stages, and ages. It's a terrible thing to be 94 and wearing a mini skirt. Even if you're alone at home with your hubby. So it's about doing the right thing at the right time. Otherwise, you might miss your moment and you might have to wait a whole new cycle to come back in and the cycle may not be available. You might be aged and old. You might be bitter when you weren't bitter before because bitterness comes when you miss the chance and somebody else got the chance and so you get bitter and bitter does not allow your gift and your future to flow as vision into mission. Hallelujah to God. Something is getting ready to happen here in somebody's life. I sense it so strongly. And what I'm trying to tell you is that you can't take a Blackberry mindset uh, into your next level of glory. You cannot take a Blockbuster mindset into the next level of your life. You cannot take Polaroid into tomorrow. The kids will be asking, what is that? Where did that come from? Is that a Jurassic fossil? Is that something from antiquity? You cannot take cassette tapes. We used to market them. I opened about... A, a huge library in my house and I discovered my VHS's, my VCR's, my cassette tapes and I thought what on earth am I going to do with this? It is obsolete now. That is how obsolete a particular type of thinking can be when you expect that type of thinking to deliver your destiny, to deliver your future, to deliver your tomorrow, to deliver your meta, to deliver your metamorpho. It won't work. You have to really analyze your life where you are right now and do a sea check does this kind of thinking that has taken over the way I reason does it match where I'm going to will it provide me the vehicle will it provide me the the, the fathom will it provide me the wherewithal to get to where God is suggesting in my mind if, I, if you don't have that kind of reasoning you cannot see the future correctly you'll see it in blurs you'll see it as men walking as trees you'll see it in clouds but you won't see the true enough picture but when you want to watch a good movie and you see the on-demand system on the aeroplane uh, it, it gives you the option to not have to watch the movie but watch the trailer of the movie and what God does is he shows you trailers of your future he invented Hollywood Satan perverted it but he was the one who invented trailers he's been doing trailers before you and I ever existed he's been doing trailers for those who are going to assist him in the process inside the Trinity to pro provide creation and he's done trailers for a long Long time. The Will Smith says it this way we don't sell movies, we sell trailers. Because we want to get them to the silver screen. Can it you get that? We don't sell movies, we sell trailers. When God wants to move you, He gives you a trailer of your life. He gives you a trailer of your mission. But you can't do the mission, nor can you do the life unless you know who you are. And if you don't know who you are, you can't do what you are supposed to do until you become the you that's in the trailer. You get it? Let me show you. Daniel 11 and verse 32. The people who do know the mirror, you call him God, but he's my mirror. One of his many names. The people who do know their mirror, they shall be before they do. If you know your mirror, the one whose image you are, you will be strong when you discover that's who I am. And when he now proposes to you, do this, do that, that are beyond your natural reach, even beyond your supernatural reach, then you won't say no. You say, I can do all things through the meta himself. The meta is Christ. He's the one beyond all fathom. He's wonderful that they said, what kind of man is this? That even the waves of the sea and the wind, they obey him. Why wouldn't they obey him? He's their creator. Look at somebody and do this. That's the old mindset. You're washing it white and clean away. You need to renew it suitable to where you're going. 
Because that old mindset won't work in your new life. It won't work on your new level. It will not work for the new you. It will not work for the best version of you. It will not work for your best day, David. It's not going to work for you. That Old Testament thinking cannot work with New Testament possibilities. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 17 and 18. Paul writes, and I quote, The Lord, that's Christ, is that spirit. Put it up on the screen for me. And where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. There's liberty. That we all, with open face, in, as in a mirror, that's what glass is, we see the glory of the Lord and are changed, metamorphosed into the same image, the one we see, from glory of the Old Testament to glory of the New Testament as by the Spirit of God. So he has spent all of chapter 3 elucidating the glory of the Old Covenant, which was powerful, but it is limited. It is no comparison to the glory of the new covenant because that old covenant has limitations this one has none everything you see in the mirror you can be depending on how much you believe and in the old covenant you get what you get by what you do in the new covenant you get what you get by what you believe that he has said to you that he has freely provided you get it do you get it so he has said this in the third chapter. He comes to the fourth chapter. Let's look at verse 6 and 7 a little more intently. Chapter 4, verse 6 and 7. For God, who commanded light to shine out of the darkness when it appeared as if there was nothing in the ball called the earth, has shined that same light that made it possible for all that was in the earth to come out, merely by speaking to the earth to say, come out, come forth several times and now we see creation that same God has shined in our hearts to give the light of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ so we have that same light on this planet on that planet on those planets then he now says something profound we have like there was treasure in the earth it was a Bible Creation was a Bible. That's why God took Moses all the way back from thousands of years in front to be the only man in the creation until the sixth day so that he could write it for us. Genesis 1 all the way to the end of the chapter. But we, who is that we, please? Shout, I am a Mongo. I am a Mongo. We will get this treasure. No. We have this treasure in earthen vessels so that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. This tells you that the power in you, the treasure in you, has nothing to do with what you know about you. It is everything about him. He is that treasure. That means when propositions come to your mind, don't shrink from them. They may take time, they may take decades, they may take years. Sometimes they may take even generations. But the treasure in you is well able to deliver on it. And if you don't start thinking in that way, you can never really get to the maximum of where you're going. If you want to know where the experience came from, it came from that kind of thinking. Hallelujah. So you cannot come into a new glory, nor shift um, into your next season of glory with an old mindset. What I call a mindset, St. Paul of Tarsus calls a stronghold. Let's analyze that. When he delivers the strongholds, he starts at the pinnacle of strongholds. And he says, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they are mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. You see fortresses. That was the metaphor. And the casting down of imaginations in some versions or arguments, raising arguments in other versions. And then to the bringing down of high things that obscure our knowledge of the Godhead and how he is, who he is, and what he does. 
And then he comes to the fourth, bringing captive every thought to the obedience of Christ. So what is Paul saying? Let's do it in reverse order. If you don't take captive every thought to make sure it is the God kind of thinking system, that, that thought is going to become a high thing that gets in the way of how God wants to do business with you. And if you don't deal with that, it graduates to a higher level and it becomes what? Imaginative, raging arguments against God's plan, will, and way in your life. And if you don't deal with that, it now becomes a fortification that you cannot wriggle out of easily. It becomes a strong grip, not on your hand, but on your mind. So if the enemy can get your mind, he's got your behavior. That's how Paul says it. This is how the Paul of Lagos says it. He says, your thoughts become ideas. Your ideas become what? Your ideals. And if they become your ideals, it determines your actions. Your actions sustained become habits. Your habits become your behavior. Be have your. They become your behavior. Behavior becomes what? Your lifestyle. Your lifestyle is where you are already beyond arguments and imaginations. You are on the precipice of strongholds. Yeah? And then your behavior determines your lifestyle. Your lifestyle determines your destiny or your fatality or your devastation. Now, Satan is a copycat. He's not an originator. He's not a creator. He just takes a system God has and he uses it for his own intentions. So this is how God gets you. He gets you with ideas or thoughts. They become your ideas. They become your ideals. They become your actions. They become your habits. Those habits become your behavior. Your behavior becomes your lifestyle. Your lifestyle delivers God's destiny for you. But Satan jumps into that and he wants to control your thinking system. So where God builds strongholds around your mind so that they, they cannot snatch your belief system from you. That's how Satan also builds strongholds, strong grips on your mind. And if you slow down your life and how you think, you will see it working in your life. There are some people right now, they can look across the church and see one bay, B. And in their mind, they go through that eight-step, nine-step process and they've made a decision. Before that girl makes it to that door, I will position myself. The women do it too. Oh. You understand? And it's got a grip. And once it has the grip on you, it's going to regulate your behavior. Determine what you do. With your time, with your life, and it gets you. That's how Satan, who causes the sons and daughters of disobedience... To walk according to the course of this age. That's how he blinds their eyes. Do you get it? Don't wait till it becomes a stronghold. Because you have to use those kind of missiles that Netanyahu is using. It's not natural. Our warfare is not natural. And so, God can accelerate the process. And he can accelerate that whole process of putting a stronghold around your mind to shift you from where you are to where you need to be mentally so you can access what he has for you in real good time. They are called triggers and encounters. And they can accelerate the speed between your initial thought of him and what he's doing in your life and his strong grip on you. Your initial thought and the mindset that will deliver your future. Let me say this to you, my friends. Bad seasons can blind your vision. Bad times can make you lose your vision. A great man who was an orator, a profound speaker, an articulate communicator, an engineer, a nation builder in the Egyptian system of imperialism, he had one bad moment by making a bad decision, which started with a thought, became an idea, became an ideal. It went on from being an ideal to becoming an action. 
and then the action uh, put him into a lifestyle where he now became a fugitive exile from Egypt, where he was designated the crown prince by Egypt, but the deliverer by God. Hallelujah. And he's washed up for 40 years on the backside of Horeb, and he's reduced to an absolute nobody. And one of the things that happened to him is he lost the key to communication. And as a result, the great orator could not speak anymore. And he became a stutterer. And his stutter was not only in his speech impediment, it was everywhere else in much of his life. Hallelujah to God. And it happened for one year, two years, three years, ten years, two decades, three decades. And at the end of the fourth decade, it is now uh, exactly 400 years of captivity that had been prophesied by God. And at that exact time, God said, this is now how I will show you that everything that happened to you was part of my plan, even though I allowed the enemy in to do what you were susceptible to because you were not able to harness your thinking to my system. But I had seen that all ahead of time because real vision uh, 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 does more for you than eyesight. Eyesight will show you the corner, but vision will show you what's around the corner. Vision is when you look at something through God's mentality, through God's thinking system. And so here is Moses. He has this burning bush encounter with God. And God convinces him, I'm going to work beyond your assets, beyond your ability, beyond your gift set. I'm going to work far beyond that because now you're completely empty. I'm going to fill you where there's no crevice of you left inside the game. And I'm going to use you to become my freedom fighter, my union leader, my nation builder, my constitutional architect to do a new thing with my people who have cried out to me for deliverance. I have not answered them, Moses, because you are the answer. That's why I've come to talk to you. And I'm sending you to them in my might and in my power. And Moses, when they see you, they will see you as if you are God. And Aaron will be your prophet. Read it for yourself. Exodus 4, 16 and Exodus 7, verse 1. Ye are God, sons of the Most High. The scripture cannot be broken. Monkey not the bone goat. Lion and lion in the bone. God, what in, in the bone? You are gods. Now, I'm not trying to uh, propose or postulate some theory or what have you that you are gods. You are gods, and the scripture cannot be broken. But we're not going to walk around saying, I'm God. It's enough to say, Son of God. My begin now, my begin. As I be man, he said, be man. The genes in me and in his mother, they are in him. In plentiful supply. We have the same genes. That means it's a suggestion that what he can do, we can do too. It also means that we will often be his agency and instrumentation for doing what he wants to do in the earth. Are you there? Do you get it? So you have this treasure in earthen vessels, and that treasure is the creator life himself. And so um, bad times can cause you to lose your vision, but good times can cause you to gain your vision. Psalm 137 and verse 4. Psalm 137 and verse 4. Do you have that? And get ready with Psalm 126, verse 1, 2, 5, and 6. Psalm 137, verse 4. How shall we sing the Lord's song in a strange land? Because they were captives. They had been brutalized by Babylon and then taken as captives into Babylon. And they lost their vision. How can we sing? Look again at um, Psalm 126. Verse 1 and 2 and then 5 and 6. When the Lord turned again the captivity of Zion, that's, that's good times. From bad times, good times. We were like them who see vision. We were like them who dream, who have desire. Then was our mouth filled with laughter and our tongue with singing. Then said they among the pagans, the Lord has done great things for them. Give me verse 5 and verse 6. They that sow in tears shall reap in joy and verse 6 he that goes forth weeping bearing precious seed shall doubtless come again with rejoicing bringing his seeds to them you see how a bad time makes you lose your worship makes you lose your vision because vision, vision worship is your spectacle for being able to see a tomorrow you cannot to, to see around the corner that you cannot see around 
Hallelujah. And that bad time made them blind to see prospect, to see possibility. However, when God turned their captivity, they started to desire. They started to, started to dream again. Can I prophesy to somebody this morning? You are going to dream again. God's going to put some ice cream in your cupboard, your spiritual cupboard. God's going to put some breakthroughs in your life. God's going to moisturize you with the glory of God, the way he's shaping clay. And it's too hard now. He puts some water onto it so that he can shape it a little better and when he gives you a lifting in your life my friend your vision will come back your ability to see around the corner will come back your ability to see how it can happen will come back please give me a witness somebody I went to visit a certain man of God many years ago in the periphery of Lagos and uh, he walked me around a brand new house that he had built and I was oohing and eyeing and oohing and eyeing and when we got to a desk where he he would do some work if he was woken up at 4 a.m. in the morning or something like that he said Apostle Paul uh, this is just a platform to see what we will do later in other words anything you get now it's just a stepping stone for you to see further than you see right now. So the goodness of God in your life is an advertisement to you to recognize that that is just a step. It's not the staircase, it's a step. It's not the height, it's the way to the height. It's not the ultimate, it's a step to the height. You're going somewhere and what I've just done in your life is to open up your vision again, to open up your faculty of seeing the future with clarity so that I can take you where your mind is now thinking and seeing so that you can understand how how I'm going to do it if you don't need to know how and if you don't need to know how I'll do it anyway hallelujah look at somebody telling watch this space watch this space watch this space so you've got to be fluid when you move with God because he starts your stronghold your godly stronghold with a thought the same way the enemy starts your downward descent with a thought so you cannot despise the day of small thoughts. And if you pay attention to them and you hold those thoughts captive to what Christ wants to do in your life and why he died on the cross for you, it's going to graduate into a high thing that opens you up to see what God is doing. Then becomes a strong argument in your mind, in your imagination, for why it has got to happen. Then it becomes a strong grip where you know these chains are taking me to my promised land. God is a moving God. So you've got to be fluid when you move with God. You've got to learn how to live with your bags packed. Because whenever we see him in the scripture, he's a rushing mighty wind. We see him again in the scripture, he's a river of living water, he's moving. Or another time, he's, he's a pillar of cloud, stationary for a moment so you can get rest at night. And he'll warm you up and transition from a cloud to a pillar of fire. He'll also be a terror to your enemies. But he's moving. He's taking you somewhere. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. How do you change an outdated or now ineffectual mindset? How do you do that? How do you change your mindsets? How do you upgrade your mindsets? Well, number one, accept that that outdated mindset cannot work on the next level of glory in your life. You have to accept that. If you don't accept that, you cannot process your progress going forward. Isaiah 43, verse 18 and 19. It says, remember not the former things, neither consider the things of old. For behold, I do a new thing. It shall spring forth now that I will make roadways in your wilderness and rivers to run in your desert. But shall you not know it? That means I can be doing something that is brand new and you don't see it because you're not on my wavelength. You're not tuned into my dial. You're not thinking the way I'm thinking. You're thinking the way you used to think when I had done things in your past. Now I'm doing a new thing in a new way. Hallelujah. Do you get it? So if you change the way you look at things, the things that you look at will change. That was written by Wayne Dyer. Change the way you see things and the things you see will change. Number one. Number two, 
Decide to change your mindset. Don't just accept that it needs change. Now make a choice. Peter realized it's not good to be in the boat. But then he had to make a decision, second step, that I've got to get out of the boat. It's safer with Jesus than being in the boat. So decide to change your mindset. It's got to be a decision that I'm going to work hard to think differently. That's why you get a PhD. It changes how you think. Because you're doing a lot of research. That's why you get a master's. Because you're changing how you think. That's the reason why you didn't stop at secondary education. You went to go and get your bachelor's degree. Because you want to change how you think. It's going to take some course of studying yourself. How you think. And, and then put the measuring tools beside how you think. So that you can see whether this thinking is outdated. And needs an upgrade. Or whether it's obsolete. And it needs to be brand new. And you see by comparing your old mindset to the proposed new mindset and you embark on the course of work. And that work is faith. Learning how to think about how God thinks about you. Hallelujah. That means be transformed by renewing your thinking. Glory to God. Please give me the message translation of Romans 12 verse 1 and 2. Let me make it clear and then I'm going to preach. So here's what I want you to do, says Paul. God helping you, take your everyday ordinary life, your sleeping, eating, going to work, and walking around life, and place it before God as an offering. Simple English. Embracing what God does for you is the best thing you can do for him. Don't become so well adjusted to your culture that you fit into it without even thinking. Pause. Don't take that scripture away. When you do things without even thinking, it doesn't mean you're not thinking. It means you're thinking from your subconscious. In other words, your frontal lobe makes the ideas through active thinking. And when you've mastered the idea, it now takes that thinking and puts it in the subconscious. And the subconscious is where, is where automated thinking takes place. So when I started to drive, I used to steal... The car's out of the house, for me, it was age 11, 10, 11. And I'd sit in between the driver's legs, and I'd steer the car, change the clutch and the gear. And I became a master that kicked him out of there. And I'd take the car by myself, and I started driving, and I mastered it. But when cars were coming on the other side, I'm, I'm thinking like this, like this, and I'm thinking about everything I do, every step in the driving process. Do you remember? Then after a while, steer it with the other... Dengue a little bit. You know, uh, nowadays with phones, we now, we now have two phones going before they had speaker phones in the car. Um, and you, you, you control it with your two legs and you're having two conversations. Because it's gone to your subconscious thinking. Yeah? So don't become so well adjusted to your culture that you fit into it without even thinking. When you do things without even thinking, it's because it has been programmed into your subconscious. It has been mastered in your conscious and your conscious mind makes space for new so it throws it into the back. Your automated thinking system. If you can get automation into God's thinking system, into your mind, then you've mastered it. You will do things for God without even thinking about it. You will deal with the enemy, punish him well, without even thinking about it in your active mind. The sub subconscious mind rules your world. So you birth it into your conscious, hold it for me, and then when you've mastered it, it becomes part of your automated thinking, the subconscious mind. He then goes on to say, instead, fix your attention on God, instead of just absorbing the culture of the day. Because culture is not taught, it is caught. You'll be changed from the inside out. Readily recognize what he wants from you and quickly Respond to it. Like the culture around you, always dragging you down to its level of immaturity, God brings the best out of you and develops well-formed maturity in your life. Hallelujah. Okay, number three. If number one is accept that the outdated mindset cannot take you to your next glory. Number two, decide to change your stronghold. Decide to change your mindset. Decide to review your mindset for soundness. For adaptability 
to the contemporary age. In other words, you are in a technology age, you have to know how to use technology for God. Number three, start renewing your mind now. And you identify ways of thinking that don't work and renew your mind now. So how you set up your business ways back in the early century may not be how your business needs to run today. How you run your life and how you raise your first set of children uh, 30 years ago may not be how you want to raise your grandchildren now. It's a different age. There are different systems. My kids didn't know a cassette tape, especially this one. He didn't really know it. The other ones never saw VHS or VCR. Some of you don't even know what VCR is. How many of you know what VCR is? That's all the old folk. Yeah, okay. So, how do you change? How do you change? Let's get to that. Number four. Comply with Romans 12, verse 1 and 2. Just comply with it. That is very standard, lowest common denominator in the transformation process of your life. So stop conforming to this world and start conforming to the kingdom. Let me say it to you this way. This is hard. I don't only want to be with people with whom I have common history. I need to be with people who have a common destiny or a common future. Because in your transition, you will be waylaid, delayed, and held back by people with whom you have a common history. Because if they don't also have a common destiny or future with you, they're going to draw you back like a drag. Do you hear what I'm saying? Because of the social keenness of the human species, as with all other mammalian species, one of the things you have to recognize is this that we believe strongly in what other people think and what they think about us and what they think is right. It is natural to mammalians, especially the human species. So you become vulnerable to how they think, how they look, what their body language is saying that was never communicated with verbiage, and you subscribe to it without even knowing. And that's why if you change your friends, you've changed your destiny. For good or for bad, depending on what kind of friends they are. If you only hold on to yesterday's folk and they are not dynamic, dynamically mobile in terms of how they see friends, you're not going to make progress at the speed you ought to if you make progress at all. What you want to do is find people who are already in your future. Meaning they've already experienced your five years from now. They're already walking in your C-suite level whilst you're still at the janitor level. And if you fraternize with those kind of people on the God side of things, you will have normality or normalization of things that you don't have normalization over yet. Because the CEO thinks very differently from a general manager. They have two different sets of responsibilities and ways of seeing things. Likewise, an apostle thinks very different from a head of department in the evangelism department. You understand what I'm saying? So you want to be with who you're going to be like tomorrow. That's huge. It's critical. I love to get with CEOs of big companies. I, I absolutely relish it because I can transport the information in the C-suite and process it into my Bible to understand the scale of what they do, how they do, and why they do it the way they do it. Because they didn't teach us to be CEOs. Whereas today's church makes the, the leader of a mega church an apostle. But the, the secular way of saying the same word is entrepreneur. Because an entrepreneur does not think like an employee. An em employee is thinking about, I've got nine hours on the job today, and I've got these tasks, I've got these goals to do. The entrepreneur does not think like that. He's thinking about budget for payroll. He's thinking about budget for operations. He's thinking about budget for marketing. He's thinking about how to upgrade the KPI so he can get better performance from everybody on the team, including his general managers, his deputy managing director, and everybody on the team. He's thinking about all sides of all things in the business. Now, when they train you to be an employee, that's a mindset. When they train you to be an AGM, that's a mindset. 
So you need to spend time with the MD so you can get the MD's mindset so that when it's time for you to shift from GM to MD, you are mentally ready. Hallelujah. There's a guy here that he's going to be clocking one trillion dollars not far from now. His name is Elon Musk. You should try and read up everything about him and filter out everything that's not from God from how he's thinking. Because there's something that he knows about the principles of wealth acquisition. Can I tell you something? Money runs to people who have vision. But money runs away from people who are blind. Do you get it? Resources, including human resource and the kind of people you need to be able to run your business, it runs toward people who have vision. It's a magnet. Glory to God in the highest. You're saying, what does all this have to do with the power of seeing yourself correctly? I'm almost there. I need to get this out of the way. So stop conforming. Start com stop conforming to the world. Start conforming to the kingdom. And learn that if you change your societal relations, you are literally changing your destiny. Who are you running with? Who's talking to you? Who has your air? Who has access to your thinking system? Who has your paradigms for the future? Sometimes, leaving a certain mindset requires leaving from the people who you grew up with. That's why Abraham could never come into his destiny as long as he remained in the same geography in which he was born. Territorial spirits were there of a unique kind. And he had to get out of his kindred. That's a thinking system. He had to get out of his father's house. That's a governing system. And he said, go to a land that I will show you. So the new mindset is, new mindset is trust God. Hallelujah. God will lead you there. When he says something, obey him until you get his mindset. So obedience is a temporary replacement for getting the mindset. And until you get the mindset shaped, honed into your subconscious, just follow Jesus. Hallelujah to God. Can I go a little further? What I'm saying to you this morning is that it is a call to review your mind's way of thinking, especially as to how to make decisions. Because your whole life, where you are today, is the sum total of the decisions you made in your history. And where you will get tomorrow is the sum total of decisions between now and then. And what are decisions? They are the summation of your thinking that brings you to a conclusive proposition that this is what I need to be, this is what I need to do to attain what God is proposing to me as an attainment. Can I get a witness from somebody in other words get onto God's page get on the same page with God come on to his wavelength why so that you can see what he sees so that you can hear what he is saying so that you can see you how God sees you and refuse to accept how other people opine how you look opine how it's going to end up with you and offer you their opinions can I tell you something friend please get delivered from demons please get delivered from princes and powers and rulers of the darkness of this age and wicked spirits in high places but the most important thing that you need to get delivered from is human beings hallelujah to God if you get delivered from what people think what people say how people say what they say especially when it concerns you you are a free man a free woman who now has some possibility to find your wings like the butterfly coming out of the cocoon and find your wind so that you can soar and be part of God's tapestry for his entire schematic plan for the beauty of the Lord in the land of the living. Please give me a witness, somebody. And slap one neighbor a high five and tell them, how do you see yourself? Ask them again with much force, how do you see yourself? And the problem is that too many people allow what they have gone through to define how they see themselves. Uh, other people not only define themselves by what they've been through, but what they're going through right now. And they determine that that is the definition of their life. The devil is a liar. How can devil paint a circumstance for you, create it to trouble your life, and then allow you to take that definition and define yourself by you? The only person who has ownership of your definition is the one who created you he created you and the Bible says concerning you he made you fearfully wonderfully so that when creation looks at you they think you are God creation never saw Jehovah because he's known by Paul as the invisible God but he put his spirit in man hallelujah and then he put man in a body and then he put man on the earth as the government of the planet in the name of Jesus so when they were looking for their God, creation could only see Adam. 
ye are gods and the sons of the most high the scripture cannot be broken and who did he call God? He said, those to whom the word of God came. Oh, I haven't started yet. Ask two more neighbors, how do you define yourself? Then tell them, I define myself how God sees me. Can I tell you how God sees you, my friends? Uh, God calls you his beloved. God calls you more than conquerors uh, through Christ within you that strengthens you. Uh, God calls you the apple of his eye, the zenith of his creation. God calls you his bride whilst he is your bridegroom. God says, you have been made kings and priests uh, unto my father through my blood. Uh, God says, uh, as his son Jesus is uh, in resurrection ascension, at the right hand of all authority far above all principalities and powers and rulers of the darkness of this age so are you in this world first john 4 17 you are the head and not the tail you are above only and not believe you are the sons of god you say but pastor i'm a woman it has nothing to do with gender it has everything to do with inheritance he said to Jeremiah, he said, Jeremiah, don't you dare tell me that I'm only a lad. I'm only a boy. You will go to all to whom I sent you. Today, I have set you above nations to prophesy, to pull down, to throw down, to destroy, and to pluck up, and then to build and plant. That's how I want you to see yourself, Jeremiah. When you speak, I will act because it's not your word in your mouth in other words you don't have your mentality anymore i am now your mentality you will think the way i think so you can speak what i speak and when you speak what i speak you will move me into action i will go into my operational mode the wind blows where it wheels no man knows where it's coming from or where it's going but you will see the trees bend you will see the roots unplugged you will see those in high places brought down you see the low come to the top they'll be snatched from the back and brought to the forefront the the paupers will become princes the nobodies will become somebody the josephs will come to the palace the daniels will rise to glory and you my friend you will enter a new level of glory in your life if you don't believe it say nothing but if you do shout yeah, yeah. to me in just a little bit to me in just a little bit hallelujah he says to Moses don't you dare tell me you cannot go and deliver my people you will do whatever I need you to do and he started burning a bush without the bush burning then he talked to him for what might have been a whole hour and then showed him that he, Moses, could work miracles that he's never seen before. Somebody shout, Meta. Say it again, Meta. Moses had never put his hand in his jacket to bring it out as leprosy. Moses had never taken a leprous hand, put it back in his jacket, and it comes out brand new. Moses had never thrown down his stick which in his future was going to make wonderful miracles across Egypt to deliver Israel. And he threw it down. It became a snake. There are things you've never done before. Somebody shout meta. meta. Not long from now, you will begin to do them. Yeah. And what he shows you that you, 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 what you can do, it doesn't even matter to what you will yet do in the future. He said, Moses, go and pick it up. Moses was afraid of his own serpent. He picked it up it became a stick again when he went to egypt he went with confidence revelation he went with confidence he said pharaoh let my people go Pharaoh said, you moses did like this his stick became a serpent pharaoh said janus jambres come bring your sticks they threw down became snake i cannot see any record that moses commanded his serpent to eat the serpents but the serpent knew what to do. It ate the other two serpents. God did not tell Moses to pick it up. Moses knew he was now thinking like God. And when he picked up his stick, it had three snakes in it. All the power of Janus and Jambres of Egypt and the power that God had given him. You're going to do things on a progressive level by a new way of thinking. Oh, that's just a handful of people. I didn't ask you to shout, so if you're going to shout, shout properly. Yeah. 
or David. The boy is 16 years old. Samuel is praying for the present king. That present king, his name is Saul. God tells Saul, Samuel, stop talking to me about Saul. I have rejected him. He was still on the throne. And I have found for myself a king. He didn't say a lad. How does God see David? David sees himself like a lad. But a private conversation between heaven and the prophet has already identified him as the king. But a boy, don't tell me because you don't have experience. Don't tell me because you didn't matriculate from the best universities. Don't tell me that because they haven't commended you or crowned you yet that you are still a child and not a king. My friend, you are a king. The Bible says he has made us to be kings and priests unto our God. How? Through the blood of Jesus. It's a way of thinking. Sit down. We're just chatting. So what God does, and I'm going to shoot through this. When he wants to move you to where you are going, he puts a desire in your heart. Pastor, I need to use you. Pastor from Texas, I need to use you. Please put your iPad down. That's where you're going. But come here first. Come here. Pastor, you're on my own altar now. <laughs> this is the desire for that. What does God do? He puts the desire for that in your heart. So once he puts the desire here, it means the thing desired is really there. It's not in his life yet, except as a desire. But if he keeps walking hand in hand with God, and he's following diligently, that desire is pulling him to where what he desires exists. Do you understand? Give me time. Do you understand that? So desire is actually faith. For the things desired. And it is the evidence of things hoped for. God will not give you a desire for something that does not exist somewhere in your future. It may not exist in your now, but it exists in your life. And your life contains past, present, and future. Hallelujah. But just because it's not in your now doesn't mean it's not already in your life. It's just in the part of your life that you haven't stepped into yet. And if you have a unique problem of a mentality that does not see yourself as a king sitting on a throne with a crown on top of your head and a scepter in your right hand, you will not be able to conceive what his proposition is suggesting to you. Do you understand? When God speaks to you in a whisper or a suggestion, it's not a suggestion, it's a command. Do you understand? So trouble comes. I need three troublers. <laughs> and they're trying to stop this visible man from getting to his prophetic destiny. What do you think is going to get him to that destiny? The power of his desire. That is what God acts upon. It is the only platform that God stands on to do what he wants to do. He asked the man, do you want to be whole? The man wasn't willing to behold, God had to give that man his own desire. You understand? Desire is meant to ignite your passion for what God has given you to dream about. What grew this church up was intelligently informed passion. Passion that doesn't have substance is a man shooting blanks. He will not get the baby. Do you understand what I'm saying? So with that passion, he now informs us, Mark 11 and verse 24. Whatsoever things you desire, if you don't desire it, you shouldn't really pray about it. Ask him to give you what to desire. Psalm 37 verse 4. Delight yourself also in the Lord. If I take all their possessions, I take all their possessions, all of them, everything that believes is the transfer of the wealth of the wicked into the hands of the righteous. And I bring them all to you. I've given them to you. And you start delighting in the new car, the new house, the new level, the new glory, the new authority. What does God say? He says, delight yourself also, not just in these things, also 
in the Lord. So he's teaching you how to delight by giving you things that are delightful. Oh God, you're not helping me. So that you won't give God toppers and call it praise. You won't give God something and think that that's how to worship him. So he gives you the best bread. He gives you the best grapes. He gives you the best clothes. He gives you what you could never imagine could be yours. He's teaching you by giving you ask, then you receive. And you delight in what you receive. Then you start seeking him because you like him more than what you're receiving. Then he starts exchanging his heart with you. So you start knocking on the door of what his heart wants for the world. So he has exchanged your desires for his desire. But he starts out by giving you desires for what you need. When you master that, he says, now delight yourself in me. When you delight yourself in me, I'm going to give you the nations. I'm going to give you authority. Your heartbeat will be my heartbeat. Your pleasure will be my pleasure. What I want will become what you want. But you have to delight yourself also. You can't delight yourself properly in God unless he's giving you things to delight in. That's why we had to bless Rachel today. So that she can delight in what her gift did for her and what her gift brought to her by your gifts. Then she now takes her worship to another level. That's how the storehouse stays full. Whatsoever things you desire, when you pray, believe, pray these things, and when you pray, believe that you receive them, you will have them. So this man must know in his heart that I will get to that chair. I must get there. So when he starts praying his desire, guess what God does? He just sends one angel and doesn't wrestle. The angels don't wrestle with demons. Just tap them like this. Bam, bam, this. You have a clear road. And this is where the next problem comes. When he gets there and he sees all these potentates, all these potentates, with PhD times three, can tap Oxford. He wants to go and sit down. His mind is telling him, sit down. But another mind in him is saying, you better not try it. <laughs> These people will eat you for dinner. <laughs> Joseph says, let me tell them my dream. When they start punishing Joseph for telling his dream, Joseph is not sure whether he should tell the dream again. <laughs> but God says, sit down, it is yours. But my point is this. This is my point. If you don't know you are a king, you will never want to sit in the king's chair. Because if you don't know who you are, the crown can be in front of you, you will never take it, even when they bring it on a tray to hand to you. The chair is waiting for you, but because you don't see yourself as a king, you won't sit in the throne. God is looking with his eyes to and fro throughout the whole earth for the righteous upon whose hand he wants to bear the scepter and say, take, this scepter is yours. What you, you determine is what will happen. But if you don't see yourself as that, you will never take it. That's why you must see you correctly so you can get done what only a king can do. Have a seat, sir. At my, no, have a seat at my pleasure. So when God has put desire in your heart, no, keep it, it's yours. <laughs> Especially that bag, I know what is inside that bag. <laughs> I, I, you know, I didn't go to the fourth row. I know the people on the front row, at least most of them. If I took your stuff, you get it by good measure, pressed down, shaking together and running over. Say amen. Do you not know who that man is? So, desire is a very powerful force. So, where God did give it to you, where did he get it from? His eternal plan, and he put it somewhere in your future. Once he put it there, he now takes the desire for it, puts it in your heart, and that now mobilizes you to go and get what is yours. How does God give you desire? He does it by what we call affirmation. What is affirmation? I told them yesterday at the workers' meeting, colored coats. Colored coats. If I had a coat, I'd give it to somebody. When Joseph's father, Jacob, put a colored coat on him, it was the robe of a king. It was a tunic of a king. It was made with 
it's like the way the Yorubas weave their very best Ashoki and the Ghanaians weave their kente. And it was a symbol of this one amongst the 12 is the king. So when he put it on him, the youngest boy in the house at the time, because Benjamin was not yet born, he should have been the firstborn. You remember that? But because his, his father-in-law slipped him a dud, what happened is that there were ten born before him from three other women, Leah and the two concubines. Eventually, uh, Rachel's womb that was closed, God now opens it at the right time. Because he had no design for Joseph to be born first. Joseph's design was to be born number 11. 11 is one on another level. Where the times, the orchestration, the alignments are better favorable to Joseph under those circumstances. And he says, I don't care what any of the ten brothers think. This is my successor. This one is my successor. So the animosity against Joseph now became a united front where those polygamous breed. Never had unity before. They were united against Joseph. Joseph needed it. So that he would understand when he's dealing with hostile environments in his workplace, he will understand that thou preparest the feast for me in the presence of my enemies. Another place, he says to Israel, rule thou in the midst of your enemies. If you can only rule in the midst of your friends, you haven't started business yet. You understand? Rule thou in the midst of, so you have to learn to be comfortable. That you know his rod and his staff, they are there to comfort you. The rod to beat the wolves. Those people who come and steal sheep. And they, you know, they steal the sheep that are disgruntled. Foolish. How dare you be disgruntled when God has been blessing you anyhow? And you, you subscribe to Satan's trade, which is what he did in heaven. He looked for all those wonderful angels who were somewhat like him. He was the chief of the beauty in heaven. If Lucifer walked across the stones at the altar of glory, the stars, the constellations would start to twinkle. The winds would begin to blow across the entire universe. Humanity would begin to praise God. Hallelujah. But, but thank God, humanity was not yet created. Lucifer fell before we were created. Because God put us in the midst of our enemy and said rule in the midst of Satan. You get it? So there were others like him and he would come to them. He says, they don't really appreciate you. So why would they give anything to Rachel and not you? It's not fear. That guy is not a nice guy. Don't worry. I will make my throne greater than his own. I will rise up beyond him. When I get there, I will treat you better. That's how he swept one third. And, and the moment it was seen in their hearts, shoo, God took them out. He said, I don't need that. When you come to marking those who cause divisions, you must do it swiftly. You pay deep prices if you don't do it swiftly. Nip it in the bud. A stitch in time saves nine, somebody said. It's not in the Bible, though. But it's harmonious with the Bible. You understand? Lightning, lightning speed when you're dealing with rebellion. Deal with it properly, otherwise it will cost you more later. You see me so, I've never broken anybody's church. It's not my character, it's not my manner. So anybody who breaks this church or tries to, they will look like they're succeeding for a while. But be not deceived, whatever a man sows, that shall he reap. I'm very good soil, you will get it back, not hundredfold, a thousand times more. I'm the man in the mirror. Whatever you give me, you will get it back. And we amplify it. Yes. How did you get there? <laughs> so, affirmation through colored coats. God will put garments on you. Garments are things like jobs, careers, opportunities, uh, fraternal systems where you're connected to people in the brotherhood of Christ. And by that, I don't mean anything esoteric. I'm talking about Christianity in its poorest and best form. Hallelujah. Uh, not just that. He also will give you Samuel-like ordinations where he's, he hears from God and, and he says, the next king is in the house of one Jesse. He said, but Jesse, uh, is it 10 generations yet since the bastards were born to Judah? Because once there has been bastardry anywhere in a family line under Levitical law, uh, unto the 10th generation, a king could never possibly come from that family line. But what Samuel probably then got to know was that the line of Jesse 
by the time it got to Eliab and David's generation, was now candidacy for the next king of Israel. Hallelujah. David probably doesn't know this. Neither do any of his brothers know this. But the timing is now right because the prophecy of Jacob is that the scepter will not depart from Judah. Even though it will be taken away for a time, it will not depart. That seems to be endless. Hallelujah. Till tomorrow, David's children are sitting on the throne. When Messiah comes back, he's going to sit on David's throne. You understand? Whilst David's slingshot and iron dome are working for him. Uh, you don't watch the news. You're only on Instagram. <laughs> yeah. so, so, this thing is dangling and it cannot go to Benjamin. In fact, it has to be lost from Benjamin. It has to go to David. It has to go to Jesse's house. And he walks into Jesse's house and he sees the first guy. He looks like Saul. Tall, handsome, charming, suave, swagger, speech. Got it all going on. And because he has a way of thinking that typified for him what kings look like, they look like Benjamin because that's the only king the Israelites have seen. He says, surely this is the Lord's anointed. God said, T -t 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 stop that. He said, I've rejected him. For man looks at the appearance of the outward. I look at the heart. That means you can learn something there. The appearance outwardly is good for favor with man, but it can't touch the favor of God. So do both. Do both. Dress up correctly that you might be favored by men. But what really makes a difference is the favor of God. Jesus had both. First, second, third, fourth, fifth, five, six, seven. He said, I've rejected all. Yet the prophet thought each one was the next. And when the lineup finished, no, everybody kept quiet. The prophet had to ask, is, is this all? They didn't recommend David. Then eventually, daddy says, not the brothers. Oh, there's another one, but he's with the sheep. You know why? David was the product of an extramarital relationship. Isn't that strange? And yet he was the choice. So he was an embarrassment to the father. He didn't want to bring this embarrassment to the prophet of the nation. He said, go get him. And from far, as David takes a step, the anointing in the room, in the dining room, was getting more and more. Someone said, ah, we baba is in Bobe. Obareo. Jale lele yo. Bale reo. Obi reo. Ranka Sidede. You get it? And he was a boy. He was 16. He said, we won't sit down until he comes. Custom, you don't sit before the king arrives. David wanted to sit where he normally sits, somewhere near the sideboards. He said, no, this is where you will sit. David did not shrink from the opportunity because what God had told Samuel, he was already getting it. Some of his messianic psalms were written before the incident of ordination. And then what happens is he sits. They eat the meal. David gets the king's portion. Samuel poured oil on his head. That's a second affirmation. I can't take it much further. But that anointing will help you kill giants, lions, and kings before you get the appointment. It's an affirmation. An affirmation helps to assert and affirm that you are who God says you are. You can do what God says you can do, and you can have what God says you can have. That's what affirmation does. So when I lift a well-behaved person up and I say, do this, it's affirmation. That's Jacob's quote for Joseph. There are signals. It's important to get that. Now, what makes the difference between being blessed and being a blessing is that you also get great life-changing favor. You see this in Joseph's life. Joseph was hated by everybody in unity and they threw him into a pit. But the favor of God on him touched the hearts of Judah and, and Reuben, and they brought him out of where they intended to kill him and bury him. Favor will cause men to hate you, but it will also single out certain men to help you, to mitigate against the hate of your haters. So he goes down into the pit. Favor brings him up to the top. He's not sent back into Canaan. He is chained. Those chains were actually divine favor. 
because it was going to handcuff him and tie him to his geographic, geographic positioning in Egypt. Do you get it? Because his destiny was never going to be in Canaan. His posterity's destiny would be in Canaan, but his destiny would not be in Canaan. It had to be in Egypt. So he wouldn't want to go. They had to chain him. Some of you, you don't want to go where God wants you to go. Now I chain with Papa God. Go take handcuff you, carry you the place where you're supposed to go. Say amen. Amen. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and when he got to Egypt, he forbade the wrong person to buy him. The right man who happened to be the king's captain of the guard, the chief security officer of the president. And he bought him so that Joseph, when he looks out of his window, he will see the palace in the same compound. So he's nearby. And that kind of affirmation where you see the palace, then God can now talk to him and he gets it because they're on the same wavelength. Now you see that place, that's where I'm taking you to. You're not sitting there by accident. God is painting pictures in your mind. Many of you, you've come to this church because you see something. Go and be that something that you see here. Be it in your office, be it on your job. Because too many of you, Chima, we settle for being blessed. That is not the calling on your life. We settle for being, and blessed is nice. You have everything you need. You got it going on. You have the admiration of all the guys in town that want to be like you, and all the women wish there was you that they, that, they, that they married. Yeah. That's blessed. Blessed is not your calling. It's your passage to your promise. Your calling is to be a blessing, not be blessed only, but be a blessing. So when he raised Joseph, he wasn't raising a blessed man. He was raising a man to be a blessing. What is a blessing? It means that when you tell me, Pastor, I, I don't want any more money. I'm satisfied. I'm content. You are selfish. That's very selfish. So what about all the starving people around you, including your house up, your gate man, the gate man next door, etc., etc., etc. You should be so blessed that you are a blessing that you can build universities. You can build institutions. You can build hospitals. You can build covadis domine. You can build things that will change people's lives. Instead of giving them handouts, you give them institutional capacity not to get fish from you, but to farm fish. Do you get it? That's what you're called to be. No member of House on the Rock should, should desire to get to a state of blessedness and park there. Potiphar's house was blessed. The palace was blessing. In other words, I'm not going to the palace to get blessed. I'm going to the palace to facilitate my king, his country's resources, the empire around him to be a blessing to all the citizens of the land. That's your role as the church, to be a blessing to your nation. But most people park at blessed. Now I'm on to my issue. Genesis 12, verse 1 to 3. Abraham, I will bless you, and then I will make you a blessing. I can't treat it today, so just know it, and I think you already do. However, my, my point is God is particular about showing you trailers of who you are in his eyes. When it got to Jeremiah, we've talked about him already. Jeremiah had no desire to be a prophet unto the nations. God had to show him trailers of what the next version of him would look like. He said, from the day you were conceived, I'd already started working on you. I already experienced your whole life outside of the womb before you even came out of the womb. And I have already ordained you a prophet, a future talker to the nations. It's already done. That's who you are, boy. Peter, he says, who do men say that I am? Eleven had the silence of the lambs. But Peter said, I know who you are. You are the Christos, the son of the living God, the Messiah that we are expecting. And what did he say to him? He said to him, you have well spoken. On the backs of men like you, I will build my church in every generation because you know how to access revelation knowledge and bypass me. In other words, you have one-on-one -on -one with me. You see, in the days of Peter, we were still under the Old Testament until Jesus was dead, buried, and resurrected. So it was angels that would bring messages to people. Now Jesus is there. He's the one bringing the message to them. But they don't have the Spirit of God inside them. But what he's saying is, Peter, you didn't get that from me. 
you went to God straight by yourself because of the canopy of the Spirit's presence in our atmosphere. Mm. I like that. And therefore, I want you to know it is your type. In other words, you are, you are the first typology after me of how I will build my church in every generation, men who have revelation. Mm. Who have revelation of Christ and who Christ is in them. So, so you are Peter. That means fragment of the rock. And upon this rock, so same substance, rock. That's what I'll build my church on. I can't build it on shifting sand. I'll build it on rock. So he's particular. Again, we see Abraham. He shows him his future in trailers. Again, you see it in Joshua. Moses has just that. He said, don't, don't cry with all these people. I know you were close. But Joshua, hear me carefully. Moses is dead. Stop thinking about Moses. Mourn him, grieve about him, but then close it down. That's why I won't let you see his body. He asked uh, Michael to go and hide the body. Satan wanted to show them the body so they could worship it. He said, Moses is dead. As I was with Moses, I will be with you. The intimacy you saw between me and Moses, that's how it's going to be with me. And you have turned my face and my whole being to you for my prized nation. You will never lack my presence, my precision, my purpose, my plan, and my prospect. But open the book of the word and read it. And meditate in it day and night. You will make your way prosperous and you will have good success. He showed him a trailer. Moses was the trailer for at least 40 years of Joshua's life. How I gave him authority is how I will give you authority. He has authority to do miracles. You have authority to conquer lands. I won't do the same thing with you that I did with him, but I will use the same anointing, but a different administration with you. I don't need you to repeat Moses. I need you to do Joshua. So you are not Moses. That's why he said Moses is dead. You are Joshua, and it is Joshua I will use. Hallelujah. Then you also see David and Joseph, who are my key concerns this, this morning. They both got significant affirmations. Joshua, uh, Joseph got the colored coat. He got his father's affirmation. Moses got his mother's projection. She said, this is a proper child. And she organized for him to enter the palace. It was beautiful. I can't go into the detail. I did so yesterday. Um, then Joseph again gets into Potiphar's house and he rises everywhere he goes to. Potiphar does not know what he owns except what Joseph tells him. And he was trustworthy. Ends up in the prison. Prison looks like a down place, but it's an up place. Why? Because he's closer to destiny than he ever was in his journey. He's next to the king's butler who has the king's ear. And that's what's going to eventually facilitate him into the palace. He's getting affirmations everywhere. And it's important that you get this, Ewas, because you can be who you are and not know who you are. And people not know who you are also. So, you can be egg on your way to butterfly, but not know that you are. Why is this important? Because if you don't know who you are, and God says you are king, you can be walking right beside the throne, and you don't recognize it's yours, so you don't sit there. And until you sit there, your authority will not be respected. Or you, you have a crown, but you're apprehensive of it because you don't know who you are. So when you put it on, you quickly put it off. You're not sure. They gave you the job and the CEO suite, but you're not walking in it. You're not wearing it. I came here to tell somebody, wear your coat of many colors. Otherwise, somebody will steal it and wear it for you. Wear your crown and walk with a swagger with that crown on top of your head. Hold your scepter and use it to regulate your atmosphere, your business, your industry. If, I, if we all get together and use the scepter that God put in your hand, that Naira will start to revalue itself to a more favorable value. And the interest rates will begin to drop. It's not going to happen because of the central bank, nor because of the coordinating minister of, the, of finance or the economy. It's going to happen 
happen because Christians are going to think outside the box and start thinking the way Elon Musk thought so that he has so much power that if you had 20 of Elon Musk in the United States they are the government because the private sector needs to come to a place where she determines what happens in the country do you get what I'm saying and that private sector is waiting for you it's wealth will not go to people who do not have vision, otherwise they will just simply abuse money. What is money for? Money is for the covenant. I suffered you to hunger that you might know the man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. And then he tells us what the purpose of wealth is. That I may establish my covenant in the earth. So if you don't know who you are, you're going to miss what is yours. It will be in front of you by the time you get there and you won't recognize it. So stop being only blessed. Be a blessing. Let's build institutions. Let's build hospitals. Let's build roads. There's a man who walked into this office a few days ago and he's the number one Wall Street banker on a level you can't imagine. And he said, what I'm coming to Africa for and I'm starting with Nigeria is to bring cheaper money so that people like you can do public-private partnerships with money that doesn't cost you 17%, but 5 6%, if I heard him correctly. So, so we can rebuild this road. We can get permission from Lagos State House and Assembly and knock down all those stupid buildings that are at intersections so that you can have four-leaf clothes and have proper access so you won't find traffic or traffic jam where there are intersections. We are a population of four, five hundred million in 25 years. What are we doing with same level intersections in this country, in this city? Where is vision? Instead of looking forward, we are seeing behind. My uncle, he made that thoroughfare 100, and, 100 meters on one side and I think 150 meters on the other side. For that reason, they were seeing far. Right now, we can build a road, but in the future, our grandchildren need to build expressways with five lanes each side and exits that do not uh, corrupt traffic. Do you get what I'm saying? Yeah. We need visionaries. Right. Government is waiting for you to enter. Yeah. And when you get there, don't let bad things happen to you like corruption. Otherwise, you will lose your vision. You go blind. Mm. Yeah? And so this resource has come. Hopefully, we will be able to perfect it. He's speaking to the right people in the country and he has found the right people to work with. So you don't have to have money to have capital. You just have to have trustworthiness, competence and capacity. That's value. So if you can prove to me you have integrity, you have the skills, you have the competence, we can get you the money. And with no money, you go and build the road. Then you own and manage for 25 years and you make your profit. It's simple. It's simple. You just have to have the value of integrity, competence, teamwork, team architecture, and you can do it. It's not hard. He understands what I'm saying. So in the Gospels, Jesus has entered the synagogue. And this is my last point. And he has opened up his text he's about to preach. And as he looks up from the Torah or the Psalms, couldn't have been anything much more than that, he sees a woman who is horizontal from the hips. She could in no wise lift herself up. That where it would take others two minutes to journey from the back to the front, it would probably take her 10 minutes. The walk from her house probably took her hours where it took other people half an hour. Because of the pain of something probably kindred to or the same as ankylosis spondylitis. Because she was bowled over for not one year, six months, but for 18 years. That she's lost her feminine dignity, she's lost her prowess as a woman, she's probably not as productive as she could be, she's lost her poise, her posture, her stature and her status because of her condition. But in spite of all that she was going through, she was faithful in the house of God. That she was always there and had been there 18 years, didn't miss a synagogue open door moment, she was there. And she came again on the right day and as she's sitting somewhere in the 
back because she did not want to be a public spectacle. He sees her and when he saw her, he saw her history. He saw her future that she couldn't see. He saw everything about her. He understood empathetically her pain, her problem and her plight. And he saw her and then said, come to me. Friend, if you are going to become all you are, you have to come to Christ. He's the one who reveals to you who you are and capacitates you with the wherewithal to be who he says you are. And as the woman came, it was a moment of silence for several minutes. And eventually she gets there with struggle and pain. And she cannot look him in the eyeball, not because she doesn't want to, but because she cannot. She's never been on the level with anybody. She's always been beneath the level. I prophesy to people who have been under everybody forever you've been under the level never on the level it's never been a level playing field for you Jesus is going to make the difference and he's going to give you a level playing field you will have equal opportunity even though you don't have equal cash but with your opportunity you probably can do more than others did with theirs than you had ever imagined possible in your life your life is about to change and she's struggling painfully to get to Jesus uh, other people are sitting right in front of him that they're not really conscious of him the old canon has made them perverse it's made them outward but not inwardly recognizing of who he is and eventually she gets within intimate space with the master and the master tells her something that is profound he did not say to her woman next week you're gonna be better just keep coming back to church woman next month something is going to happen for you no he said woman you look at the tense Ah, he told her who she was that she didn't know she was. He said, this is who you are, but she did not know it. Is it possible that there's someone that you are that you don't know you are yet? Is it possible that you are on top and you don't know you're on top yet? Is it possible that no weapon fashioned against you because you're dealing with a weapon somewhere in your life right now and you feel the weapon is going to dismantle you, disparage you, ruin you, defame you, libelously slander you till your reputation is assassinated, the devil is a liar. No weapon fashioned and against you shall prosper why because you are the heritage of the Lord this heritage you have that you shall condemn those voices hallelujah and he told her who she was she didn't know it when he told her who she was it empowered her to move from who she thought she was to who God sees her to be that's the whole purpose of today's thought so that you will know who you are because whatever you think you are is whatever you will continue to be. But when you change how you think about who you are, it is your opportunity to grab it, receive it, and stand up to it. And the woman, the Bible said she didn't stand up like this. It didn't take her two moments. It didn't take her two minutes. She did this. The Bible says straight away. Your way is straight. That amen sounds too weak. Yeah. Bible said, and he laid his hands on her. He gave human contact for the divine spirit to lay hold of her. And the Bible said, immediately she was made straight. And her first reaction was to glorify God something is about to happen in your life your business was bent over but immediately God is going to put his hand on it and it will stand straight up and your reaction is going to be to God be the glory your family is bent over and has been bent over for two years five years ten years fifteen years but by the hand of God upon your life accompanying his word you shall see signs and wonders in your family that will make ears tingle in all Nigeria and wherever the diaspora is. Your future vision and your roadmap to destiny has become a crinkled piece of paper that you don't want to believe anymore and you've thrown it into the trash can and you're going to live your life anyway, anyhow because as far as you are concerned, God has disappointed you. That disappointment, God is going to take the DIS out of it and he's going to appoint you to the destiny he originally planned for you, Jeremiah, the destiny he planned for you David the destiny he planned for you Joshua the destiny he planned for you Deborah the destiny he planned for you uh, uh, Moses the destiny he planned for you Joshua in the name of Jesus Christ say I receive it 
And so he spent time advertising to you with colored coats, all kinds of affirmations so that you can have a desire for it. So that when opposition comes, you won't back down. You might do some rethinking. Was I going the right way? What do I need to, to give more precision? And the Bible said immediately she stood up straight and she began to glorify God. He didn't need to preach his sermon. We didn't see him go back to the sermon. She was the sermon. You will become the sermon in your tribe, in your family, in your village, in your home, in your island, in your section of Lagos, in your local government. You will become the Bible for all men to read across the nation of Nigeria. And they will want to know who is your God? Who did this thing for you? Hallelujah. 18 years, nobody paid any attention to her. She did not know who she was. Can you imagine? She had lost her life because she had lost some vertebrae, but she got them back. That means she got everything her life could give her. The key is not only a key. It's your access to your car. Your access is your access to the worldwide network of roads that you can travel in your country. Hallelujah. It's your access to many things. And if you arrive in a jalopy, there's a way they treat you. But if you arrive in a chariot, there's another way they treat you. You understand? So when you lose your key, find it quickly. I've given you a key today. I didn't ask you to clap. If you're going to give glory to God and to God alone, give it to him properly. She didn't know who she was. But he told her that she was something she never knew she was. What I'm trying to say to you is that you can be rich and living in ruin so you don't know you're rich. You can be whole and living with a horrific illness so that you don't know you're whole. You could be a billionaire, and I'm not talking about in the Naira, and be so broke and bankrupt that you don't even know you're a billionaire. You could be a king. But because you're 16 years old, you think you're a kid. You could be a giant killer. Because you haven't even killed a cockroach, you don't believe you're a giant killer. But God sent me here to tell somebody you are who God says you are. Amen. Start believing it. Because it's never about doing that's caught before the horse. It's about being. When you be, then you can do. If I'm an apple tree and I'm well planted in soil, I will bear apples, not oranges. The people that do know their God, they shall be strong and then they will do. You don't do to become. Buying the Birkin or the back to match the shoes and the necklace to match the earrings, to match the bracelet, that doesn't make you anything. The same way that 10,000 likers or 500,000 subscribers or followers who like you on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, or whatever it is, that doesn't define you. There are people who have no likes, no subscription, and they're better than me and you multiplied together. You hear what I'm saying? What defines you is who God says you are, and you owe it to your generation. The whole nation is waiting for you to find out who you are. A whole industry is waiting for you to find out who you are. If you don't find out who you are, you're not going to do what God called you to do. There would be no David if he didn't know who he was. What, what, what happened for David in terms of his great affirmation? Samuel anointing him with oil in front of his hated, hateful brothers was one. Killing the lion was a personal, private affirmation. Those are important. Killing the bear was another affirmation. But when daddy said, take these cheese sandwiches to the battlefield, as a waiter, he went as a waiter. And when he got there, he saw a battle. Nobody was prepared for that battle more than the boy. The people who were trained at Sandhurst, they wouldn't stand up to the fight, but David was ready for it. Let me show you his affirmation. Fast forward. Goliath is in the battle, and David is the opponent. One is a giant, experienced warrior from youth. The other is a youth. One has never been to battle except in the private arena of lambs, bears, and, and uh, 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 lions. 
They have a conversation, it's rough, it's spicy. Goliath is spicy, David, spiced, calling him a dog. David said, uncircumcised, I will deliver your head, he was seeing vision, to the fowls of the air. He didn't say head, he said plurals. And before they could get into a fight, David had released his artillery missile. Goliath comes down. David doesn't leave it there. Because if you don't cut off the serpent's head, you haven't won the fight. He runs to the battle, he doesn't even have a sword. He takes the enemy's weapon and uses the enemy's weapon. That's what God is going to do with your life. Where you can take less and do more with it. And use the enemy's weapon to cut the enemy's head off. God gave David problems all his life because he was invoking the creative power inside the man. So that he could discover himself with all those affirmations and with all those problems. Una, where they run from problem, you know, get destiny. Una, where they run from problem, wahakas, wahala, we want naka, yawa, we want gas. You know, get destiny. Run to the battle and allow the battle, the problem, to show you what you have on the inside. When the battle was over, David said, no, not a hurry. He collected the head. He's a bloody man. And he collected the sword. We know he collected it because he took it to go and keep it in his place. Then he eventually put it in one of the tabernacles. And he did like this. You will spell victory with your hands lifted up. Yeah. Then the women started to sing in soprano, alto. And the men didn't want to join you know, just in case Saul would deal with them. But they eventually, they eventually started. Mm -hmm. They added bass. They added. The whole nation went into chorus to affirm a champion who was a little boy. Can you imagine? Despised and rejected of men. Starting with his family. His hatred started at home. Then everybody now took on that until he knew who he was and did what he could do because he knew who he is. And he started to sing. David, Saul has killed his 1,000. That's a lot. That's a lot. That's mega. But David has killed his 10,000. How Saul no go back? From that day, Saul marked David. But it was heaven's affirmation, the anointing, and then the populace's affirmation. The whole country saw David as their champion. That day, he became king. That day. He wasn't appointed yet, but he was anointed king already. God's going to give you those kind of affirmations yeah. all through your journey. The king might not celebrate you, but God will make sure heaven and earth celebrate you, that you will know who you are because you will face battles that will try to blind you to the continuity of your vision through you for years and decades and decades and decades and decades, then to your posterity. What they stole from you, mark my words, you will get it back in cash, or in kind, believe it, and then build a team around the plan. It's going to happen. Yeah. Hallelujah. Yeah. Thank you for making our time to listen to this message. For additional information of this and other ministry products by Pastor Paula Devarasin, please contact us on 01-461-4120 or 01-461-4135 or by email to info at houseontherock.org.ng You can also visit our website on www.houseontherock.org.ng